Just as we do each and every week, it is time to break down one of baseball's many divisions as we look ahead to, of course, a new season on the horizon starting next month. Looking forward to it. He is Gary and Thorne. The other one, Steve Buchanan. Guys, wink, I guess, when I say your names. I am Adam Kaufman, and we're going to look at DFS, of course, DraftKings Sportsbook, a whole lot of different things. Bukes, let's start with you here in the AL Central, the Thanks. Minnesota Twins. As we know, postseason has not been kind to the Twins over the last several years, but still entering this season with high hopes. Uh, Byron Buxton is, if he can find a way to stay healthy, can this team make some real noise? Yeah, it's a big if because Byron Buxton is usually not able to stay healthy, which is unfortunate, though, because you look at the numbers that when he's healthy, it feels like we haven't been able to tap into his full potential. I mean, since joining the majors in 2015, he hasn't played more than 92 games in all but one of those seasons. But you do look at his power progression, especially over the past two seasons. It's really had an uptick as of late, and we know he has that speed on the base pass as well. The Twins don't have the offensive firepower like we've seen over the past couple of seasons, but they're still going to be very, very competitive. And Buxton is one of those small pieces of the puzzle that, if he can stay healthy, will be a big-time contributor. So that in mind, Gary, and what is the fantasy upside here for Buxton if he is on the field? I mean, upside is the key word. He is nothing but fantasy upside. Um, in an era of baseball where we're all searching for stolen bases, this is someone who not only has the potential to be a 2020 guy, but possibly a 30 20 guy. I mean, as Steve was talking about, his power potential has been off the charts the past two seasons. In fact, among players with at least 400 plate appearances the last two seasons, his 273 isolated power is the 16th highest in all of baseball. It is higher than Aaron Judge's isolated power across the same span of time. And you just don't think about Byron Buxton as that type of player, but he has, again, the upside and the potential to be. So I do think he is such a key piece of what the twins are trying to do in 2021, because the way this team is built, you know, Steve kind of mentioned that they're not quite the offensive team. They were maybe two years ago, but they're still an offensive team at the end of the day. That is how they're going to win games. And then they're kind of hoping that that middle of the infield and middle of the outfield defense that Buxton and Angleton Simmons can provide you kind of gives a little bit of a floor to that pitching staff that has a lot of questions. So he might be the most important player on the Twins, as crazy as that sounds, in 2021. Crazy sounding, Gary, is the Twins have lost 18 straight postseason games, which is a North American professional sports record. The DK Sportsbook has this team at 88 and a half wins going into this year. You're going to go over or under? It's just too high a number for me. I, I could see them going 85, 86, something like that. I just have so many question marks when it comes to this pitching staff. I mean, again, I do like the offense. Uh, I mean, Nelson Cruz, say what you will about the guy's age, but until I see him not hit 35 home runs, I'm just going to assume he hits 35 home runs. Uh, you know, Josh Donaldson uh, still in the mix in the middle of that lineup. Miguel Sano is a bit of a question mark, but we know he has upside as well. Um and, and again, I think Anderson Simmons is like the perfect guy to put in this lineup because you need nothing offensively from the shortstop position. Just go out there and save 25 runs defensively this season. Alex Kirloff might come up and be a pretty good middle of the order hitter. So there's potential here. But once you get past like Barrios and Maeda, what can you even rely on here? We've got Hap, I guess he'll eat innings, fun. That's something you can't say about Michael Pineda, who's never thrown 200 innings in a season. Don't think he'll start this year. Uh, Randy Dobnak, like it just gets a little dicey, a little quick for me. And I think even though I trust their offense, I trust their defense. I think the pitching is going to be their downfall, which keeps them from being like an elite MLB team this year. Bukes over under 88 and a half. Yeah. This number is just a tad bit too high for me. I mean, Gary was, I think being a little bit generous about that rotation. And let me tell you, he wasn't exactly ringing their endorsement either. Really, for me, after Kenta Maeda, it's like a lot of maybes, could be's. That word potential has been thrown out in these two questions seven times already. Like, I don't want to take an over on a team just under 90 wins for their, you know, their projection there and take the over there. I mean, that's, we need a lot of that potential to click. And that's not exactly what's been happening with the Twins. I mean, look at all that playoff misery that they've, they've endured. So, I think if the number is just a tad bit too high, can they be in the high eighties? Absolutely. Could they absolutely, could they get 84, 85 wins? Yes. But if that's where you're landing on, then the under is the answer for this one. 
The White Sox, of course, coming off their first playoff appearance since 2008, and now a new manager, not that they went young. They've got uh, Tony La Russa in there. I don't know exactly what to expect, Steve, from this team, but we do know there's a lot of young talent there, especially Eloy Jimenez and Luis Robert. Who do you like better between the two? Yeah, I mean, I've been a big Luis, uh, Luis Robert backer, I mean, really since he came up to the majors here. And even after a September last year where he was slumping, Robert still ended up hitting 11 home runs, knocked in 31, finished with a 203 isolated power in that shortened, weird season that we had last year. Like, we saw the potential that this kid has, and there's a reason why he was so hyped up coming through the minors and making it to the majors. He's going to make the adjustments. I have no worries about him at all. Both Jimenez and Robert aren't exactly the poster boys for defense, but offensively, both of these players are going to shine, and that's where it's going to be important for the White Sox. What about you, Gary, and which one stands out? Yeah, I think when you're looking at this from a fantasy perspective, it just has to be Robert. I mean, Jimenez might have the safer profile just from a pure hitting perspective. Uh, I think he's going to strike out less. I think the power is a little bit higher uh, than it is for Robert, but Again, stolen bases are just this entity that is so hard to find right now in fantasy baseball. And I think Robert has the potential for 2020, 25, 25, maybe even 30, 30, depending on how much the White Sox actually want to run this season and where he sort of ends up in this lineup. Like if he bats sixth or seventh, he might really just be given the green light on the base pass to make things happen. So that's kind of something to keep an eye out throughout spring training, kind of where he's hitting in this lineup. But just the ability to give you that stolen base upside makes Robert the better fantasy play. And again, just so much untapped potential here that both are great, but you got to side with the guy who is the five tool player. Sox are Gary and the favorites to win the division. And as a Red Sox fan, I just wanted to hear those words come out of my mouth, but we're talking about the white Sox here, obviously minus minus one thirty. Can they get it done? I think so. I, I think this is pretty good value. Um, you know, the projection systems aren't in love with this team, which is understandable. The track record isn't great. So uh, some of the projection systems aren't loving the individual players as much as maybe, you know, an individual could. Uh, I think Fangraphs has them tied with the Twins for 87 wins this season. Uh, Pakoda really doesn't like this team. They have them finishing third in the AL Central, which I think is crazy. Um, but you just look at the top end of this rotation. And, and again, we could spend all day comparing the twins and the white Sox, but I think you don't have to do anything else aside from the white Sox can roll out Giolito Lynn, uh, you know, depending on how you feel about someone like Dallas Keuchel and maybe a bit of regression from last season. All right. But he's still by far the fifth best pitcher between these two teams. Uh, and I think the back end of their rotation has a lot more upside and talent if we're just being perfectly honest too. So, uh, I'm going to lean with the better overall pitching staff when I think these two offenses could basically be a wash. Buke's rotation getting the edge for you too? You know, you know when you're about to go bungee jumping and they give you like this waiver and you just like gloss over and be like, yeah, 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 whatever. And you sign your name. That's what I think about the projections that, you know, aren't in love with the White Sox. Like, get out of here. Like, the Twins aren't going to win this division. I mean, come on. They're one of three teams that you aren't getting plus money on to win a division. It's the Dodgers. It's the Yankees. And it's the White Sox. Look, this division is basically coming down to two teams. It's either going to be the White Sox or the Twins. I don't think any of the other teams are going to surprise us and steal the division away. So even though you're not getting the plus money on here, it's a long season. Many things can happen, of course. But the White Sox in that division feel like the safest play. I have no problem going minus 130 for them to win the division in this one here. A lot better value than I think than taking the Yankees or the Dodgers who are minus 200 and more. So minus 130, yeah, it's not the best bang for your buck. It's not the most exciting bet you can make, but I think it's a safe one. I figured the comp that you would make there would be like anytime you have to sign up for new Apple software. When's the last time you went bungee jumping? It doesn't matter. It's just a comparison. So let's go to the next question. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the Apple Cleveland software. Indians here. Who is this guy? My God, Francisco Lindor, as we know, he is gone, but of course has led that offense, or at least did the last half dozen years. So now with Lindor gone, I mean, Jose Ramirez, is there anyone more fantasy relevant on this team, Bukes? I think one of the most underrated signings this offseason was Eddie Rosario to the Indians. I mean, he has an isolated power of at least 191 in four straight seasons when he was with the Twins. He's been hit with the Twins his entire career. The knock on him is that he's not great defensively. He's certainly not going to draw a walk for you, but he's going to do one thing that's important. He's going to park 
the ball out of the ballpark. And that's what the twins need. That heart of the lineup for the Indians, say what you want about this team. They're not going to go very far, but at least the three, four and five hitters are going to be a problem for opposing pitchers. And Rosario is going to be in that mix there. He's going to knock guys in. He's going to collect some RBIs. So I think this is a great spot for him. They got him on the cheap. He had a down year in 2020. So it wasn't all that expensive to get him here, but I think he's going to be somebody that once we're a couple months into the season, People are going to realize that Rosario is a big player on the Indians. What about you, Gary? And other than Jose Ramirez, who stands out to you? I got to agree with Bukes. Uh, I mean, really, when you're talking about Cleveland positional players, let's be honest, it's kind of slim pickings. It's it's pitchers that really drive this team to fantasy relevance. But Rosario is like unimpressively consistent. That is what I would say about his career to this point. Like, is he someone who's going to blow you away? No. Is he someone who you're like, legitimately excited about to grab at a fantasy draft? Probably not. But at the end of the year, you're going to look up and he's going to have batted 272 with 31 home runs and probably around 100 RBI because he's going to be batting in the middle of this Cleveland lineup. Um, He's also somebody who doesn't strike out a lot. Now, there are different versions of that type of player. Like there are guys who don't strike out a lot because they have good plate discipline That is not Eddie Rosario. He just swings at everything. So eventually he gets a hit before he gets to two strikes, but that's fine too. He puts the ball in play. That's all you want, especially when putting the ball in play results in home runs as often as it does for someone like Rosario. So from the bats to the pitching staff here for the Indians, Gary, and you've got Shane Bieber, who of course is coming off a 163 ERA last year, his very first Cy Young award. It was a heck of a year during the pandemic shortened season, plus 400 on the DK sports book to repeat as Cy Young. Do you think he will? Here's the thing that I think is important to note about the AL Cy Young versus the NL Cy Young. There is no good pitchers in the American league. Like, let's just start there. If, if we want to compare the odds, Clayton Kershaw right now is 20 to one to win NL Cy Young. Marco Gonzalez is 25 to one to win the American League Cy Young. So here's Garyan's definitely going to lose you money tip of the 2020, 2021, excuse me, MLB season. Just put money on Garrett Cole at plus 350 and Shane Bieber at plus 400 to win the American League Cy Young because no one else has a chance to win this award aside from maybe Lucas Giolito, but I'm not that scared of that guy anyway. These two pitchers are so much better than every other pitcher in this league. It is insanity. So one of those two guys is going to win. Put money on both. Forget about it. You fall in line with that, Bukes? Uh, Kind of. Some of it. Not all of it. I mean, the American League is very wide open when it comes to American League Cy Young. I absolutely agree with Gary in there. Tyler Glasnow is plus 950 to win the Cy Young. You want to talk about strikeouts? You want to talk about what people get excited about? That's what Glasnow is going to bring. He didn't have the best 2020, but I mean, we could say that for more than 75% of the league last year. The thing with, with Shane Bieber, too, and this, this really goes for all the pitchers. I mean, if there was a season last year that favored one side, the pitchers absolutely had the advantage over hitters last year. And I think we definitely saw that over the first month or so that like, you know, hitters are just kind of getting acclimated where pitchers are kind of, you know, they don't really take as much to kind of get into that game mode where hitters do with timing and whatnot. So nothing against Shane Bieber, nothing against any of the pitchers last year, but let's see what Shane Bieber looks like in a full season here. He has the stuff. He has the strikeout ability, the swing and miss stuff, the highest of his career last year. Everything was fantastic. But I think the American League is one of those long shot ones. You know, you can get some decent, you know, return on your investment with Garrett Cole, with Shane Bieber. But it is so wide open right now that I think this is either a bet to ignore or just take a long shot. Bukes, we're only a half dozen years removed from the Royals winning the World Series. And as we know, rebuilding in Kansas City at this point in time, long ways off from all that success. Is there anyone on this roster that excites you? Yeah, Adalberto Mondesi had a really slow start to the year, but really came on fire at the end. But it was easy to overlook because the Royals were basically out of it when game one started. They had no chance. They're not going to have a huge chance this year either to contend. But if Mondesi, from an individual perspective, if he's going to do anything, if he gets on base, which was a bit of a struggle for him last year, he's going to steal a bag or maybe even seven. I don't know how he does it, but he just ends up doing it. Of the 128 attempts that he's made in since he's been with the majors, he's stolen 113 bases, 
He's got some decent pop too. Like he's definitely somebody that can hit between 11 to 13 home runs during the season. So I think he's somebody that near the bottom of the lineup, it's not the best spot to hit, but when he gets on base, he is a threat. He's one of the lone stolen base threats really overall that's left in the league that you can count on for 30 plus stolen bases. So Mondesi for Bukes. What about you, Gary and anyone else? I mean, there's not a lot of guys uh, who really get me too interested on this team, but I will say a squad like the Royals is one of those environments where I think you're trying to attack from the bottom. Um, I think you're trying to find guys who are in spots for bounce back seasons who are just dirt cheap. Uh, And someone who fits that bill for as awful as he looked last season is Andrew Benintendi. Um, He's going outside the top 220 picks in NFBC formats right now. And I mean, I, I don't mean to keep harping on this, but it's true. We are looking for stolen bases wherever we possibly can. And Benintendi is someone who had 220 stolen base seasons in his time with the Red Sox. And during those two seasons, he was a 121 WRC plus hitter. Uh, He had a really good swinging strike rate. All that went out the door in 2019 and 2020. So we do kind of have to fudge the numbers a little bit to make it seem like he's a palatable outfielder. But again, the risk is so mitigated by where he's going in drafts. And we know what the Royals want to do. They are a team that lives and dies with the stolen base. So if Ben Benintendi is going to get 700 plate appearances batting in the two spot behind Whit Merrifield in this order, there's a decent chance he ends up with 15 to 20 stolen bases this season. And at his ADP, I think that's a lot of value. The DK Sportsbook has the Royals at 72 and a half wins. And just listening to the two of you guys break down this roster with very tepid upside, obviously. I don't know, Gary. And I mean, are you going to go over or is this an automatic under for you? I wouldn't say it's automatic, but I, I don't really have a great read for this team. I think for me at the end of the day, this just comes down to someone has to lose games in the American league. And you start looking at these divisions, you know, you can make the case that there are four above average or maybe good, depending on how you want to like classify the Red Sox in the American league East. Uh, There are three above average teams in this division. We just went over the three of them. And I know Steve likes the Mariners. Like there are four above average, decent teams in the AL West. Like the only three teams I can legitimately say, I think the Royals are better than are the Orioles, the Tigers and the Rangers. And I just think when you get in that class of team, like I said, someone's got to lose some games and their pitching staff is atrocious. So I think they're going to end up below this number. Bukes, where do you land? Are they atrocious? Is that pitching staff really atrocious? Gary and Danny Duffy, Brad Keller. I wouldn't say they're the worst one-two punch that you have. What if they can milk something out of Mike Miner too? What if they can rejuvenate Mike Miner's career? Here's what I think is possible. This Royals team is going to score some runs. I actually really believe that this offense is better than you'd expect. Carlos Santana, Andrew Benintendi with Merrifield. I mean, if you look at last year, they actually tied the Indians for run score. They both scored 248 runs. I don't think that's a positive. <laughs> it's not a positive, but here's what it was. The Indians were able to squeak in and make the playoffs. So at least offensively, they were kind of sort of aligned there, at least with runs scored. I think they're going to be a bit of a surprise this year. I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs, but I do think that taking the over on their win total is something that is extremely possible. All right, well. We'll uh, wrap it with this team, and that is, of course, the Tigers. Rebuilding just like the Royals. Bukes, we'll stay with you here. Is is there anyone who's fantasy relevant on this team? I think Robbie Grossman playing in the leadoff spot is a great signing for the Tigers. He's played 132 games in the leadoff spot, has a career 331 on base percentage in that spot, and he's going to get consistent at-bats. The problem with Robbie Grossman has been in the past that he's always been kind of a bench player. He's been that role player. He's not going to get that with the Tigers. He's going to be an everyday player. He's a switch hitter, obviously, at the top of the uh, Tigers lineup to set the table. I think is going to be something that's going to help his fantasy value. So I think Robbie Grossman is somebody that, again, just looking at the name, it doesn't get you excited. But a couple of months in, you might realize that Robbie Grossman can actually get some things done when he gets some consistent at-bats. And he's absolutely going to get that in Detroit. So I think that's going to be somebody to keep an eye on. Gary, and is there a more exciting name than Robbie Grossman here? Um. There might be, I guess, especially for people who have like, you know, a history in DFS. I think Matthew Boyd, anytime you talk about someone who's got a 30% strikeout rate going outside the top 300 picks, that at least like gets your attention. But 
I'll, I'll back Steve up entirely here. I think Grossman is just one of the best values in redraft this year. Um, there are questions, obviously. I mean, he's someone who is a switch hitter, but there's a reason he hasn't gotten many at bats against left-handed pitching. He's just not been that good as a right-handed bat, but playing for the Tigers, they might not care. They, they might just see someone who can play every day, like Steve said. So if we see in April that he's still leading off, regardless of the handedness of the starting pitcher, at that point, he's someone who could like outproduce his pick value right now by like 100, 150 spots. Like it's, it's crazy how much value he could possibly bring back. I think Tariq Skubal is someone who's kind of interesting too. High strikeout rate coming into his sophomore season. Uh, Jonathan Scope is just like a cleanup hitter you can get for nothing in redraft format. So there's some value to be had here, but none of it is like exciting. Casey Mize, Gary, and is a plus 1,500 odds on the DK Sportsbook to win AL Rookie of the Year. We haven't seen a lot of them to this point, obviously, but do you like those odds? Not really. Um, I think they are long enough, I guess. Um, and it seems like, I know, I know the Tigers are saying right now that he's kind of fighting for a rotation spot. I, I know it's it's a different animal than 2020, but I would be surprised if he started the year in AAA. I think he's just up now. Um, but I look at guys ahead of him on these odds, uh, particularly position players who could just rack up volume stats. And I think there's a reason Randy or Rosarena is like the odds on favorite here, but even someone like Ryan Mountcastle, who's 12 to one right now. Yes. His 141 WRC plus from last season was heavily assisted by a 400 BAPIP. That's not going to happen again, but he could just bat third or fourth for the Orioles for 150 games this season and finish with, you know, 90 RBI and 90 runs scored and 30 home runs. And I, I think that's just enough to win rookie of the year over a pitcher who, you know, might have like a four ERA across 25 starts this year. Bukes, how do you like Mize's chances? Yeah. I mean, you look at the positional players that are eligible for the award this year. It's, it's really deep. Like I, I would be shocked if a, if a pitcher of any caliber relief or a starting pitcher wins the award this year. Obviously anything can happen here, but Casey Mize is not somebody that exactly jumps out to me as a good candidate, even at 15 to one odds. Like the hype was there last year when he was called up, they were excited about him and he kind of, you know, didn't really perform as we expected. I mean, granted it was his first go around in the majors, but Walks were an issue for him. They weren't really an issue for him in the minors. Home runs was a big issue for him when he first came up. And, you know, like I said, don't not going to hold it against him in that season. But I didn't see enough from him, even in those seven starts that I said, yeah, maybe we will get something out of him in a full season next year. 15 to one odds they are nice long odds. But at least from what I saw last year, I don't even know if that's enough to get me enticed. This time next week, we pivot back to the National League and continue our tour division previews across Major League Baseball, getting you ready for the start of the 2021 season. For Gary and Bukes, I'm Kaufman. Thanks so much, guys.